Howdy, Tudzilla Files. Welcome to another episode of Escaping the Cave. Escapingthecave.com is the website. You can get me over at uh, Twitter, at ATC Pod. Facebook as well. There's a page and now a group. <laughs> a meager group. That's the way I like it. I know all the people in there. We discuss things sometimes. How you doing? Having a good week? Having a good month? It's been about three weeks, I guess, since I've uh, released a podcast. Hmm. This summer has been great. Weather-wise here in Michigan, it's been fantastic. It's been hot. It's been sweaty. I've been outside running, riding my bike. Talked about that in the last episode. Lost well over 20 pounds now. And the nip of fall is in the air. <laughs> Calendar flipped over to September. Temperatures dropped into the 50s. Barely getting into the 60s today. Feels like fall. Feels like the election is on the way. Ugh. Ugh. It's going to be a weird episode today. I'm going to get right into this. I'll add some stuff to the back end as well. But the uh, podcast is about ready to ramp back up. It's been uh, meager. It's been sporadic. Some would say spastic like a bad colon since uh, May. I wanted to be sure before I threw myself back into this that I was ready to go full bore back into it. It's been a difficult process. I'll get into a lot of this, I think, at the end of the show. Uh, But we're ready. And today, you are in for a treat. It's not just my voice. (laughs) I'd like to introduce you to Brian. We'll call him the professor, Brian Hayes. The professor, he's not. That's an old um, nickname we gave him at the radio station that we both worked at about 20 years ago. He was the professor, Brian Hayes, on the air. He was also program director, turned into a radio executive uh, once upon a time before he decided to move on to bigger and better and more stable things as radio entered hospice care. He became a psychologist. That's right. Media, psychology, and now he is working in the public relations field. You can see why Brian is the perfect guest for this program. The confluence of media, psychology, and public relations. And we can sort of tie technology into all this. And he has a great deal he's going to be able to add to this program. And not just today. We have arranged and planned and uh, motivated each other into a commitment where we're going to sit down, I think, uh, every weekend. We're going to record at least one episode, if not more, on a regular basis. I've made uh, promises to you, the loyal listener, before, usually about content that I don't get to when I say I'm going to. But this is pretty solid. We've been having a lot of conversations over the Internet, over the phone, in person, since we reconnected about a year ago. And it's pretty obvious that our current fields of interest, these evolving interests that we have because of our backgrounds and what he's doing these days, they line up almost perfectly. I floated the idea for him to come on the podcast before as a guest, and that conversation has sort of evolved into him becoming a regular podcast member. So, what we did last weekend was we decided we'd sit down and test the equipment, see how things sounded over the internet. He lives on the other side of the state than me, and so we can't really get together on a regular basis and have him here in the studio with me. So, it's more efficient, obviously. I think you get it. So, we'll do it like a lot of podcasters do, via Skype or Facebook or Zoom or whatever. We sat down, did the equipment test to see how everything sounded, checked the delay, see how we you know, interacted over the phone rather than being in person. And it turned into one of those conversations. And it turned into something that I think is a really good introduction to Brian on the podcast. So that's what I've got for you for the first segment today. It runs about 20 minutes. And then I'll come back and there's a few things that I want to add to this and some, uh, some things that I've got. Uh, to sort of tease you with what's coming as we ramp things back up and as we head towards this shit show of an election. You ready for it? I hope so. Anyway, let's get to it. Creep. 
I have nothing planned, nothing prepared. Okay, yeah, I don't either. I'm working my way through propaganda. Did you get it? Yeah, I like it. That's the Bernays version, right? Mm-mm. You got to be careful of that because that book is, like I said on the on the chat we had, that's like uh, it's PR for propaganda. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's trying to sell that right. industry to you know a skeptical 1920s audience, and I think that was shortly after he had changed the name to Public Relations. Uh, which, uh, yeah, right. Because I bought that book too. Public Relations. Yeah. Which one's that? That should be coming. That should be coming soon. It's another Bernays. He wrote like a 400 page book called Public Relations. He did. Yeah. I don't think I know about that one. Yeah. Twenty eight twenty eight fifty on Amazon. Wow. It's a thick one. It's almost like a textbook, I think. I want to see what that is. I don't think I've heard of that. And that bothers me because I thought I knew <laughs> No, I'm serious. I thought I knew everything he'd written on that. Just go to, I just typed in his name in Amazon and bam, all that shit came up. Relations. Just a, there it is. Just yeah. A 19... blue, yeah, blue hardcover. 1945. Okay. So this so is... it's like 20 years after he yeah. sort of started his theory and, and uh, uh, that pretty much solidified it as a, as a public relation, as public relations as a, as a practice by then, you know? Yeah. Yeah. First half is a history of public relations. Second half is the application of it. Mm-hmm. That's what this says. According to Amazon, I may grab that. Mm-hmm. Cause it would be really interesting to see how he evolved after 20 years. Mm-hmm. And then the interviews of him in the in the um, a century of the South mm-hmm. uh, were really good too. Yeah. Did you finish that up? I'm on. I saw the last one to do. It's hard to watch that stuff. Is it, maybe it's just a production value, and maybe it's the voice. I don't know what it is, but it, it's, well, it looks like it's from. It looks like a production from the '80s, but it, the thing came out in 2002. But it looks like it was done in the '80s. It really does. Yeah, I think. Well, did it come out in 2002? Really. Yeah, yeah. Is it's all analog, right? Yeah, I don't know, but at uh, you know at the bottom, you know, at the end of the sh- end of each show, you know, you get the Roman numerals that says you know when it was produced. Oh. And fortunately, fortunately, I remember my Roman numerals from uh, <laughs> elementary school in the seventies. I'm always <laughs> able to tell when a show came out. But can you do the metric yeah. system, Brian? <laughs> yes. Did, did, did you guys do metric? We did, we did metric. They started on us, I think. It was like there was a space did, or something of the day. I want to say it was a fourth, fifth grade kind of thing. And then by sixth grade, I think somebody in America had decided that we were too good for it. And that was it. Yeah. And we never, never saw it again. That sounds right. And the only time anybody ever said anything metric was when we were drinking a two liter. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we know what that is. So yeah. You, oh yeah. We, you got the other, uh, so you got some Lipman stuff coming as well. Uh, yeah, not yet. I'm going to get through these first mm-hmm. and then, um, yeah, cause I'm, I've got a habit of ordering like seven books, reading one of them and five sit on the shelf, you know, or six. So I do know. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I have to, I have to read these and then I'm allowed to order more. See, Lippmann's really interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. and I, I really fascinated this guy cause he, uh, when he was young was sort of a raging socialist. He was really? like a revolutionary. He had problems. He was such, so le- so far left that he, had problems with reformers because they weren't radical enough. Hmm. And that as time went on, he started to kind of see <laughs> sort of Oz behind the curtain. Oh, and okay. Completely started moving toward the center and then it started edging in toward conservatism a little bit. But the thing that got wow. him, the thing that really got him was World War I and the use of propaganda here in the United States to drum up support for the war. We didn't want to go to war in World War I. And the media uh-huh. campaign was the first real frontal propaganda assault in this country to change public opinion about the war. Huh. And then he got involved with um, – he was in the, the, the actual propaganda department. It's actually what they called it. And mm-hmm. he, he went over to Europe. Well, that was before propaganda became a bad word. Right, but it was right? that phase where it would start – it would be become a bad word because of this. Yeah, because it's just, it's just a, derivative, a, a derivation of a Greek – uh, I think saying or a Greek phrase or something like that. Yeah, I th- so, I mean, the word in, in and of itself isn't, isn't a bad word and the, no. and the use of it necessarily isn't bad. It became demonized, you know, basically by the Germans. Yeah, right. Exactly. And, but the thing is, is that when they exposed what the Germans were doing, people mm-hmm. saw that we were doing the same thing. It's kind of like the, 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 you know, the word socialism isn't necessarily a bad word in and right. of itself and what it stands for and what mm-hmm. it means. 
it just became associated with, um, you know, evil empires, you right. know, yeah. through propaganda. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, Castro and Hugo Chavez yeah, well, and a few other people, but yeah. But it was all propaganda, right? Right. It was all associating, it's making emotional connections yeah. with something that's relatively innocuous. Well, when you get into the psychology of it, it's relatively innocuous, I guess, when you're making, you know, make it an argument or something like that. But when you start figuring out the psychological aspects of it and how to manipulate mm-hmm. and trigger people via their own little cognitive, this mm-hmm. hole in their mm-hmm. firewall, mm-hmm. then it becomes a weapon. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, when you point. weaponize it, that's right. different. Right. 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 Yeah. But that's that's kind of where it's at. And that's what that's where Bernays and uh, Sigmund Freud, you know, his what was it? His father-in-law, brother-in-law? His uncle. Uncle. Yeah. So you've got Freud who's doing this research, trying to figure things out. Bernays sees it. And he's like, hey, we could use this. Mm-hmm. Like, we, can, we can sell cigarettes to women. <laughs> <laughs> so Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing that really, that really fascinates me about it. And uh, I, the, the, the light bulb for me went off when, when I realized that my pursuits in media and my pursuits in psychology were not mutually exclusive of each other. Right. Mm-hmm. And how I, how I ended up in a career in public relations makes perfect sense. Right. Cause I'd spent a little bit of time with thinking, God, I must just look like this guy who doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. But at the end of the day, all roads kind of lead to a, to a, a PR guy. Somebody said something. It's like, if you do, if, if you're, if you're doing, if you're doing something, God, how did they say it? Anyway, the the bottom line was if it, if you do it one way, it's education. If you do it right. another way, it's propaganda. What, what is the it phrase? Depends, uh, it depends. It, it, the perspective depends on whether or not you agree with the material. Oh, that's right. That's right. So you one man's education, material. it's Frank Luntz saying what he does. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I started, I started fi- uh, following that guy, Frank Luntz. You remember him? The name is so familiar. He was the uh, the guy in the George Bush administration who would find phrases like he's the guy that uh, turned the estate tax into the death tax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. He's kind of a big guy, right? Kind of a kind of a heavy set guy, and he, he yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I think he's uh yeah he's a he's a wordsmith. He's, yes, he's a, he, yeah, he's a genius at that kind of stuff. I, I know what you're talking about. I hated him when he was with George Bush. But back during that that entire thing, I just despised him, everything about him. But I started following uh-huh. him, following him on uh, Twitter. I've got like six people on Twitter that I follow, and he's one of them. He's just doing his job. Yeah, that's exactly right. And he is upfront about what he does. He he. Oh sure, I've he seen him, it. No, I've seen him on television saying, you know, this talking about how you phrase things and how you find these words that create, you know, the the right mental imagery inside of someone's head, the right, the, the emotive response that I like to talk about. And he's direct and upfront about it. He's not mm-hmm. hiding and, and decorating himself up in, in makeup of any kind. And mm-hmm. I love that because you can learn a lot from somebody like that mm-hmm. if you can take the, yeah. the judgment away. And just yeah, listen. especially since he's honest about it. I mean, yeah. part of part of his sales pitch is that he's honest about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He's, and he's upfront about it. Yeah. What you see is what you get, and therefore, what I give you is authentic. Yeah. And you can, yeah, you can take that and you can apply it to different areas that may seem, you know, disconnected to a lot of other people. But that authentic and genuine information, and that that, that I guess directness of intent. I, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It just gives him a little bit of a little bit of credibility that I can take and I can apply in different various areas that I've become mm-hmm. very oh, interested yeah. in. <laughs> oh yeah, there's no there's no there's no veiled curtain. The, yeah. He's doing it right in front of you in broad daylight. It's yeah, that's that's invaluable. If you why? Because it works. It. Why? Because it works either way. Whether you know it's coming or not, you have no defenses against it. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a really good way to look at it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, once you take an idea and, and attach it to an emotion, you're done. You're oh done. yeah, that, done. and that's it. That's that's cash, that's what the check. that's what propaganda is: creating an emotive response and uh, turning a pro, you know creating the proselytes and militants who are conditioned for a specific intended action: voting, one, getting out in the streets, whatever. It's one of the things I, I fight against in my current work is because you know you get the leadership and they always want you to put out facts, tell people this, tell people that, mm-hmm. you know, sell these features and benefits, all that kind of stuff, and it's like, guys, that's not going to work. So, and trust is, I don't know if trust is necessarily an emotion or if that's, or if it's an action to trust someone. I don't know if that's an emotion, but anyway, um, you know, trust and hope, right? those are the emotions you want to go for. Well, I mean, can't trust be a choice? If, say, if, you, if someone's telling you something you want to hear, you can choose to trust that person. 
regardless of the veracity of it. If it's something you want to hear and something that plays into your, your schema. Yeah, so I guess trust is, is sort of an action, isn't it? It's not yeah. really an emotion in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, there, there's this thing that I keep thinking about where um, I think it was – I think it was in Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, where they, he pointed out that there are uh, these mental processes where you hear a piece of information and you ask yourself, can I believe this? Which I, I guess translates into trust. You could just uh, interpose believe and trust. Can I believe this or can I trust this person? And if you mm-hmm. want to, if it's something you agree with, you'll go through all the post hoc reasoning and everything else necessary to find mm-hmm. a path to either belief or, in this case, trust. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, That's right. if you don't like it, and if it's it, then the question becomes: Do I have to believe this? Must I believe this? Must I trust this person? Well, it's, and then and then it gets really interesting because we call it you know taking what you're saying and you know making it more of a colloquial. You know, we we just call that mental gymnastics. And the more mental gymnastics you have to do to believe something, the harder it is to change your mind after you believe it. Sure, right. Right. Yeah, accountability. Well, actually, it, beca- it becomes it actually becomes nearly impossible yeah. to change your mind about something once you've had to do some mental gymnastics to come to a belief about it. Well, that's why that's why you know with the current administration, you know, we'll never change the base. There's uh, Jacques Lul in, in that book of his propaganda talks about something that I've called uh, social momentum. And so you've gone on bringing this into the into the technological age and you say you've gone on television. You're a supporter of Donald Trump and you've gone on television and you have made these ridiculous loyalist statements or you as a private person, you've gone on social media and you've Mm -hmm. waged verbal and rhetorical trial by combat with various people over the years, over the years and over the years and been so forceful in these opinions and these proclamations. How do you walk that back? You're, you're, it's almost like you're trapped in this momentum and you can't oh, yeah. change course because it's humiliating. To the, There's no way. Yeah. There's no way in hell you could. Yeah. It's fascinating. And, 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 mm-hmm. and, and we are, you know, I had this episode that I did, uh, one of the very first ones I did, I called uh, Cyberspace Monkeys because we don't know what this technology and this, this ubiquitous, instantaneous and global connectivity is doing mm-hmm. to us both psychologically and socially. Well, it's going to take generations to see it and figure it out. We can guess all we want, yeah. but we're not going to know until the, until, you know, the, 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 the social, uh, really evolutionary changes take effect. You know what I mean? Sure. That's, that's, that's the, that's the, that's when we're going to know. Yeah. And that, what's changing us, right? Well, we I think we've got, we're seeing the first generation now, aren't we? I mean, it's I think we've got good guesses. Yeah, I think we've got good guesses, but we don't have we don't have facts about any of it. We, there hasn't been enough. Yeah, there hasn't been enough time, right? But we know that um, our social interactions change a lot more quickly, right? But what is that doing to us emotionally in the long run? I think right now it hasn't been long enough that if these devices went away. Um, after a few years of tantrums and and you know, gasps of, uh, you know, last gasps of life of social media or whatever. Um, I think uh, extinction bursts, we used to call them, we, I think they still do call them in, in psychology. When you have a, a behavior that you're trying to extinguish, there's an always an, ex- where there's always a point where the behavior gets worse before it gets better. That's an extinction burst or before it goes away. Um, but, uh, I think, you know, there would be some, some problems for a couple of years, but over time we would go back to the way things were pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I did a little bit of a, an experiment on myself because I, I've been pretty, uh, I don't know, I, I, I like to call myself, I, I have this comparison between digital and organic in, uh, human beings, <laughs> you know, an organism. Mm-hmm. And for the last mm-hmm. 10 years or so, I've been way out of balance as far as my, my actual life living in the real world and living online since the traveling mm-hmm. sort of started to dry up and everything, most of my perception and creative outlet has been on the internet as a sort of a digital avatar. And so I did an mm-hmm. experiment starting at the beginning of June. I got rid of pretty much, I shut down my main Facebook profile I, and just cut all incoming uh, signals as best How'd I could. <sighs> Terrible. Yeah. At first. Yeah. And yeah. then it was like, oh, I can go outside and run. I can go outside and ride my bike. I can read a book. I can read something that's longer than one page long. And you know what? When I get done, I don't have to tell anybody about it. 
<laughs> you don't have to. You mean, you mean you don't have to take a picture of it right. and share it on Instagram or some nonsense bullshit? Right. Right. But yeah. the, the, there's there's a downside to that though, and that's that it, because with the technology, I mean that that's a nice personal organic experience you, or experiment you can do on yourself and experience it and mm-hmm. all that. But the the simple reality is that I can do that, but the rest of the world doesn't. Well, you and I are roughly of the same generation. I think we're you know about yeah. four, maybe five years apart. Yeah. And so, you know, we were equipped early on in life with the ability to function and, and keep ourselves relatively entertained, right? Yeah. Through play, through, um, you know, friends, through imagination and television and whatever, you know. So so we, come, we, we grew up with ways to keep ourselves entertained and educated and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right now, we, you know, we have, I think, this first generation that's now old enough to vote um, is the first generation that has come up entirely with social media, right? That's, what I, was, one. that's what I was pointing out a couple of minutes ago, because we do have that yeah. first generation that mm-hmm. has digitally raised mm-hmm. within, you know, primarily, or I don't know, primarily, but significantly, partially an electronic organism, that their socialization yeah. and their perception of the world is almost exclusively online. Whereas we had television and we were getting, you know, maybe, you know, like Friends or Seinfeld or something like it. We were getting input, digital input as well, but not nearly the fire hose that this generation that's now getting ready to vote. And a lot of them are out in the streets this summer. And we don't know really how this generation was affected by being so uh, raised so uh, intensely. With mm-hmm. this digital influence, that's mm-hmm. what fascinates and scares me because it's, I don't think we can know it until we take it away, <laughs> right? Oh, preach, Brian, preach! <laughs> I'd love to see it's that. Gotta, it, it's got to go away before we can know what the what the consequences are. I mean, we can do some. We can do. I mean, there are quite a few people. I'm not saying that this entire generation is fucked, but there, are, I'm sure there there are a few pockets of people in this generation who um, have abandoned social media, who choose not to be on social media or whatever. Yeah, very few. It's almost like cutting your eyeballs out, I would think. If you well, what, would be the comparison, like what would be the comparison for us, you know, people in their early 50s? What, there, would, what would be the comparison to take something away from us? Would it be television? There's nothing to compare it to. This is the cyberspace monkeys. There's, I don't think there's yeah. an analogous comparison to what mm-hmm. this is and how, how pervasive and ubiquitous and almost seemingly essential this has become to what we mm. experienced as children. Oh, yeah, for sure. I don't know. I can't think of anything. I've thought about that because I'm, I'm trying. You know, I'm trying to make these connections and comparisons so maybe I can empathize or something. All I can think of is television. Tele- you know? Maybe television in the 50s or 60s, though, right? Because it came out of the blue. And it changed yeah. everything immediately. But, but, but I think we were, man, maybe not the first. I think maybe our parents were the first generation that was actually raised on television, right? Where, where there was TV in the household from the day they were born, right? Which is kind of the comparison, I suppose. Whereas I think for us, um, it had already kind of been, we, we actually, you know, I think in our generation, the Generation X, I think, you know, we were raised by television. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because it was our parents were the parents were the first first parents to, to both go to work. Right. 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 Last and kids. And yeah. yep. And so we were left with television to, to yeah. raise. So I was raised. I spent many hours with Gene Rayburn and Match Game. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, what so a I creepy spent, babysitter he was. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. And uh, oh, my God. Game shows and Bob Barker, everybody. So, um that's the only thing I could compare it to. So I guess going back to my original point from a few minutes ago, we don't, we don't have enough data right. to be able to look at this yet and, 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 and know what it would be like to not have this. We may not have enough data to do a, a, a study on it, but would, I mean, would you and I have been fine without television eventually? I mean, if somebody would have said no TV, we're, 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 we're going to be a household that doesn't have television. I have friends like that. Brian, they're fine. I grew they're up, fine. I grew up in the middle of the country. I didn't, I didn't ever have cable. So yeah, I we had, didn't have cable either. We had three channels if the antenna exact, was working that that's day, ex- right? Well, we had the same experience. Thank God somebody <laughs> could understand. So I pretty much did grow up without television. Yeah. I watched yeah. some. I watched Night Court. That was my favorite show. I think it was every Thursday night <laughs> I would watch that. And that but that was that was pretty much it. So I was outside or I was I was doing something in my room with my imagination. Let's leave that there. 
<laughs> no, not like that. <laughs> Creep. There it is. That's what we came up with last weekend. Sort of improvised off the cuff. Wasn't intended originally, I don't think, to be a podcast. We considered it. I guess we both kind of <laughs> figured out that when it got going. Yeah, might as well release it. It's a good place to start as uh, sort of an introduction to him. So that's Brian Hayes. He's going to be on the show uh, starting, um, well, now. Sort of a play date set up for this weekend. We'll record another episode or two, and we'll just take it from there and play it by ear. There's a couple of things, though, in that clip that uh, when I went through and listened to it, I wanted to add a few things here at the uh, back end of this podcast. And the first one was there towards the end. And he posed the question, what is the comparison to older generations between this onslaught of technology and how it changed people, how it changed society? What is there an analogy, a comparison that can be made, a relatively recent comparison? And Brian suggested television. That's the obvious thing, right? And I put forth that we do not have anything to go on, that this has changed us, is changing us in the process thereof so much and has changed society, is changing society so quickly and so rapidly with what I've called the fire hose of information, this deluge of disconnected data that's impossible to sift through. It's impossible to sort. We do not have the resources, the psychological and mental and cognitive brain power to sort through all of this. I can't think of a comparison that even remotely works. This is brand new to the human experience. You could go back to the Gutenberg press, I suppose, but those effects took decades. People had to learn to read in order for the Gutenberg press to really take its hold and have its effect on society. This is happening instantaneously as a direct result of a technology that has been unleashed upon us, that we have unleashed upon ourselves without considering, without even wondering what it's going to do with us, going into it with our thumbs in our butts, like, oh, this is great, democratized information. Yay, it's going to be great, democracy utopia. It's not working out that way. I think I mentioned in the other podcast, maybe I haven't, I don't know if I was doing this when last time I released, it's been a while. Anyway, I'm running, I'm riding my bike. I'm out in the woods, I'm out on the back roads, hours at a time. And I've switched over from listening to music to listening to my old podcasts. The ones that I was releasing just over a year ago. July and August of last year specifically, and when I was focusing on Jacques Ellul's book, Propaganda. I sort of wanted to go back and I wanted to critique myself. To be quite honest with you, I wasn't sure I wanted to continue doing this. And I wanted to hear these podcasts with a critical eye. With the professional ear that I developed a long time ago to listen to them to figure out, okay, is this really any good? Is this something that should be continued? I was looking for a reason not to continue this. And then I started listening to those podcasts. And you can call me arrogant, you can call me anything you want. Those podcasts are more relevant now than they were a year ago. There's this thing that happens when you create something. Maybe you know this if you're a writer, maybe you're a painter. If you're any kind of an artist, any kind of a person who does any sort of creating. When you spend a lot of time on it, and you get immersed in the piece, no matter what it is, your eyes change. You become too close to the product. I hate to use that word, but whatever it is you're creating. And you can't quite see it because you have made it. You can't quite see it objectively. This is why writers need editors. They're too close to it. This is funny. I've noticed this in myself. I I do a lot of writing, have done a lot of writing over the years, and I've noticed that I cannot edit myself. I'll leave ghost words in that I completely gloss over when I'm going through and I'm editing my piece. I completely miss it. I'll show it to my girlfriend. She's like, did you mean to have the, the in there? Like, no, where's that? Oh, Jesus, I miss it. It happens all the time. It's because your eyes are used to it. It's your piece. You are not looking at it critically and objectively enough because you made it. You're really close to it. You're very familiar with it. 
so you can't quite see it as it is. Whereas, a stranger's set of eyes will pick it out, pick out things that you won't be able to see because you're too close to it. Now, when you step away from the piece for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and then you go back to it, then you can use fresh eyeballs because it's not in your short-term memory or whatever it is. I don't really know what that is. I just know it's a thing, all right? So I think that's what happened with my podcast from last year. I thought they were good at the time, but I'm like, are they really? I mean, I enjoyed putting those together. I put a lot of work into them. I put a lot of, you know, a lot of blood and sweat into these things. But I haven't listened to them in a long time. I should put my headphones on, and while I'm riding my bike for two hours, I should listen to my podcast. And holy shit, you know what? There are things that I'd like to change. But as a whole, as a collective group, the information contained within those podcasts are good. If I do say so myself. And I do. And now, here in 2020... As we are riding this pandemic wave of of hellfire towards another election, another shit show of an election. As we're inundated by various degrees and kinds of propaganda, disinformation, spin, whatever you want to call it. These podcasts from last year resonate loudly. Loudly. I wish I were doing them this year instead of last year. And... To my everlasting shame and regret, I wish I had finished that series. I only did a handful of them. I was going to go through pretty much every section in that book and dissect it on this show. I did maybe a quarter of it. Maybe. I have other files. I have text files that have been sitting on this computer for a year that I never got to. As I got carried, I don't know. I can tell you there is something very specific that happened. That knocked me off course. Cancel culture came my way. I never expected that at all. It wasn't from the podcast. Not at all. It was from YouTube, of all things. And I had to reckon with that. I had to sit here and think to myself, hmm, is this something I really want to deal with? Is this something I really, really want to stand up and look in the eye? Is it worth it? Is it worth it to endure what could be coming next? Do I want to do this? And I could not answer that with a healthy, hearty yes. Because of the lack of hope that I have, that I I did talk about this in the last episode, that this is going to do a damn, a, a rat's ass, a flea's nut worth of good. I'm not convinced it is. So why would I subject myself to that? Any more of that? It wasn't even that bad. But it was the first indication of what is probably going to be coming my way a little bit harder and a little bit faster the longer I keep doing this and the more this podcast continues to grow. And, by the way, it does continue to grow despite the inactivity. (laughs) I put current events stuff in these podcasts from time to time. But that's not the foundation of the show. It's current event stuff. Therefore, the stuff like the propaganda material, the uh, democratized opinion material, the cyberspace monkeys material that I started with, the Media 101 podcast still continues to get downloads, and it's, uh, what is it, two and a half years old. That leads people to other material. It is still growing despite me not really doing anything. And I had to ask myself, was I ready for that? And I I could not because of the lack of usefulness, not usefulness, effectiveness of being a utility, a tool for some sort of positive change to help people, people that want to be helped in this growing cacophony of propaganda, of spin, of agitation, of hatred, bilateral hatred. That's about to spill over the caldera cone come November. There is, I don't see, any legitimate hope that I, personally, can make any difference with my efforts. So why? Again, I'm asking this. I know I'm being redundant. Why would I want to put up with uh, that? I haven't been able to answer that question for a long time. But there are indications now 
And this came to me a couple of months ago while I was lying in bed trying to figure out if I wanted to continue this thing. I was thinking to myself, self, I said, that's what I call myself, a self. I said, self, it's entirely possible that you're just ahead of the damn curve again. This is so self-evident, so apparent, so obvious that people are going to have to start seeing this sooner or later. The confluence of profits, technology, propaganda, commoditized information, and data, and technology. How this is affecting us. It's too obvious and too powerful and too potent and too destructive to the fabric of society for people not to be able to see this for very much longer. And lo and behold... As we move closer to this stupid election, yay democracy, huh? there are indications that people are finally catching the fuck up. Eureka! I saw another one tonight. What was it called? The Social Dilemma. This is a new documentary that I saw, Tristan Harris from Your Undivided Attention, one of the podcasts that have given me hope, a little sliver, a modicum of hope over the last year. Well, he posted on Twitter that the uh, Social Dilemma It's a documentary released on Netflix, dropped this very day. I did a little Googling on it. I hadn't heard of it. Despite my interest, I hadn't heard of it because of my sort of fasting from social media. Well, there's an article in the LA Times talking about it. They call it an indictment of the tech industry saying it lays out the damage being done by Facebook, Google, Twitter, through their platforms and search engines. The how and why of what they're doing. And what needs to be done to stop it. Been little indications from Bill Maher, of all people, talking about using my, my phrase, my damn phrase, the avatar. Yeah, I know he didn't steal it. I have to always say, hey, Bill Maher's not listening to your podcast. Yeah, yeah, genius, I get it. Thank you for pointing that out. But I've been talking about the social avatar, avatar since 2016. Other people are seeing this. I'm not bragging. I'm pointing out that people are catching up. Very very, very slowly. But again, there's going to come a point of critical mass here where the damage being done is so destructive and so obviously coming from one certain aspect of our collective lives. Hyper-connected technology, instantaneous reach of thoughtless opinions spreading around the globe. The sharing, the instantaneous sharing of what amount to propaganda posters from the 1930s and 40s in the form of memes. Disinformation links coming from dubious sources being unchecked by the the sharer because the sharer likes the content, agrees with the content. The content fits snugly within his worldview, within his schema, within his imagined order, within his ideological slash propaganda scripture without any consideration of the veracity of the content, thereby sealing the echo chambers, these parallel informational universes in which we all seem to live, sealing them off a bit more. So we're operating under different rules of cognitive physics, where the sky isn't blue across the ideological divide to both sides. It's a different color sky, and we're ready to go to war to defend our right, our opinion that the sky is pink. It can't go on unnoticed forever. That was the realization I had in the middle of the night. That maybe I should just bide my time. Maybe I should keep reading the material, keep learning. I have a lot more to learn. I understand that. I've made some mistakes. In fact, I'm going to talk about those really soon. Maybe not today, maybe in the next episode, but there's some things that I myself have had to reconsider. One about social media itself. This isn't an easy problem. It isn't just a matter of unplugging it. The other's about the internal attorney. Heights Rider. Sitting on top of the elephant, the emotive elephant. And its role. I was under the assumption, I took the platonic assumption, as in Plato, that the writer was there to seek truth. I wanted to believe that, that human beings at their core are really motivated at discovery and finding the truth. I wanted to believe that about people because I want to believe that about myself. However, I delved into Plato's Republic and uh, discovered... (laughs) 
thanks to a little help from Height. Glaucone's counter-argument to Plato is that now people are not interested in the truth. People are more interested in their status, how they look, how they appear to other people. Appearing to be smart, appearing to be wise, it ties in Tamus, something I talked about last year as well, the illusion of knowledge, the illusion of wisdom, where, where people do not care. The being, the actual being wise is much further down the list of priorities than appearing wise to the herd. Status. That's the purpose of the writer, to litigate, to perform the role of the internal attorney, arguing the emotive conclusions come to by the elephant. The emotions. The emotive conclusions. The rider's not there to steer you down the right road. The rider's there to convince you that you're already on it. One of the things I had to reconsider. I intended this part of the show to be about two minutes long. I was going to get into another clip that I found to get back to the main point about comparisons, how there is no real comparison to another point in history. And after I went through and started editing this piece with Brian, I realized, hey, I had just talked about that last year. How there is no comparison. Here it is. I read Nicholas Carr back in uh, 2017. He's got a uh, a very, very good, uh, incredible book called The Shallows. It's a few years old. It's almost a decade old now, I think. But it was a book that he wrote that started to investigate and talk about the physical effects of too much time online, being too connected to technology, what that does and how it changes your brain, how you get addicted to it, how it actually affects the way you physically think. The neuroplasticity of your brain works against you. You get used to it and you cannot function efficiently without it after after a period of time. It's repairable. Your brain works both ways. I mean, if if neuroplasticity works to adapt to the technology, it will also readapt when the technology goes away and relatively quickly. There is hope down that line. But I think there's got to be a synthesis here between Alul's study on propaganda, the psychological effects of propaganda, propaganda proper, and there has to be a a synthesis with the technology. There has to be a lot more to this because none none of this, it talks about the mass media, it talks about over-the-air radio and television and your newspaper delivered to your house every day. But when I talk about how memes have become the new propaganda poster, he had no concept of how you could have however many people you're connected to. A lot of people have thousands, tens of thousands of people that they're connected to via Twitter and Facebook. And having these memes come in via both channels, being able to find one and click retweet and click share and have it go out to thousands of other people. Can you imagine Goebbels being able to do that with his propaganda posters back in the 30s? That's what we're dealing with here. There is no precedent to this. We have no idea where this is going. We are only seeing the very, very, very beginning of the consequences of this blind, headlong rush into a technology we do not understand. I think there's going to be studies. I think there's going to be books that are coming out on this. Eventually, it's going to be the negative effects are going to get to the point where they're going to have to start studying this stuff. But not yet. Nobody seems to be really delving into it. The synthesis of propaganda and technology and how that affects people. Again, I think the two main points we have to keep in mind is we do not know what this is doing to us. And listening to that, having the conversation with Brian, reminded me of Dr. Eli. Dr. Eli, Elias Abijaud. I hope I got that name right this time. I did a show on him last year in his book, just a small segment of it, called Virtually You. This book came out in 2011. People have been noticing the changes in people for almost 10 years. They have been writing about it for almost 10 years, sometimes longer. Nicholas Carr's book, I think, came out in the same year. He references Carr in this book from nine years ago. Brian put forth over the weekend that he thinks that we're not going to know 
the effects, be able to study the effects of this for decades. I think the research is out there. I think at least the hypotheses are out there, the indications, the studying of the indications of what this technology is doing to us. The subtitle of uh, Dr. Eli's book is called The Dangerous Powers of the E-Personality. And one of these sections that I went through this weekend, he was talking about, he's a clinical uh, psychologist, and he had a patient that came in, she was having problems in school. And it reminded me when I was reading it, I made a note of it. In 2017, I wrote college campuses in there. And there's another section in the book where he starts talking about the way we learn, how it used to be passive learning, how we used to sit in class or sit at a lecture or sit in a meeting and listen to the people who were talking, who presumably knew what they were talking about, as though we had something to learn from them. That's changed. As far back as nine years ago, he noticed the change that it has gone from passive to active slash interactive learning, thanks to the technology, thanks to how we interact online. That's his thesis. Where we are participating with the teacher, offering our own two cents, our opinions, as though our opinions are as valuable as someone who is an actual trained authority on the matter. And how we cannot sit by and passively listen to anything without interjecting. Our critiques, our criticisms, our opinions, our hatred, however you want to look at it. This is a direct, I keep seeing people on college campuses going to these lectures, these talks that people have been invited to give. And just because they don't like the content or don't like what they're saying, they feel like it's appropriate to stand up and shout them down, often off the stage. Despite the fact that there are many more people in the audience most of the time that are actually interested in hearing what the speaker has to say. This is new. Now, he was writing in 2011, and he pointed out something that I had forgotten until I reread this just last week. That we were experiencing this, you see, the stuff that I'm talking about with the college campuses. Of course, that presumes to come from a, uh, someone who's critical of the left, liberals. But we were enduring this in 2009 with the Tea Party. Where Tea Partiers were showing up at town hall meetings, at public meetings, school board meetings, and doing the exact same thing. Remember? Wearing proud member of the mob t-shirts. Remember that? Do you remember that? It's the same exact behavior. Except being perpetrated by middle-aged white guys wearing, you know, Lipton tea bags dangling from their wide-brim hat as opposed to some hippy-dippy college chick. But it's the same exact behavior. I remember, because I was in the liberal camp, I remember how we reacted to that. Let them talk! It's the same way That conservatives are responding to these cancel culture warriors on college campuses these days. Shut up and let them talk. If you don't want to hear what they have to say, leave. Let the other people there listen. You are not required. Your attendance is not compulsory. Go. And that, of course, is spread to uh, tenured professors, people teaching classes, If the student doesn't agree with what the professor is trying to say, with the material he is trying to instruct the class with, now they can shout him down and they can have him basically purged from campus. Anyway, this is starting to ramble a little bit. I get it. I've got a lot of pent-up stuff here. I have piles and piles and piles of material. I think I've told you that a million times over the last year and a half. (laughs) It's still here. It's actually grown a little bit. So what I think I'm going to do moving forward, I did promise you that I was going to uh, boil down and repost the uh, Democratized Opinion Podcast. That is one of my most downloaded episodes. It was from uh, early, mid, uh, May, I think it was May of 2019. I think it's sitting at number one or number two. I have to go back and look at it as far as downloaded episodes since I resurrected the podcast in May of last year. It's doing very well, uh, but not enough people have heard it. I say that with all humility. (laughs) I do. Plus, that had uh, 17 minutes of current events material where I was ranting about uh, Justin Amash 
and his sort of being sprung on the political scene a year and a half ago. I wanted to get that out of there. It's not pertinent today. It sort of blocks the other material. It's a 17-minute maze that has to be navigated to get to the core, the crux of the material. I don't like that. So I'm going to re-release it. I took that 20 minutes and probably another 10 or 15 out, I think. I didn't count it, but it feels that way. And I'm going to put that up. Brian and I are going to record another episode on Sunday, I think. I'll release that, and then probably what I think I'm going to do, and this could change, in all likelihood with everything going on in the world, and today, you know, I haven't even mentioned uh, the Trump tapes yet. I I may have to call an audible here and there, but I think I'm going to return to the propaganda material, the book, Propaganda, the stuff that I didn't finish from last year. And I'll probably do the same thing I'm doing with democratized opinion stuff. I'll probably take it. I'll probably cut the current events material out of it, go through and boil it down to the core, and re-release those as new episodes. Not exactly reruns. And in fact, I may add some stuff to it as well, because some of these episodes, all of these episodes are over a year old. And there may be other things that are worth adding, worth amending, that have become apparent in the last year? Maybe. I'm not 100% sure about that. Probably I will. Either that or I'll tag them as I've tagged this one. But that's what I'm thinking I'm going to do. I'm going to try to also finish that book. Propaganda and Democracy. Propaganda and Truth. This is all stuff that I did not get to last year. Hugely important. The part about propaganda and democracy? (laughs) Oh, so I think the last section in the, in the main part of the book before he gets into the appendixes, appendices, whatever you call it. And I remember reading that and being like, oh boy, oh boy. And then Brian and I will uh, do what we do on the weekends, early part of uh, each and every week. We'll see how this goes as we, <laughs> together, we sit here in this clown car and careen towards this election in two months, two months' time. There's one other thing I wanted to mention. There was a, a relatively decent, well, I don't know, an interesting article on uh, the Washington Post website this week. It was one of their perspective opinion uh, pieces. But it talked about the simulations that those in government were running, trying to predict and prepare for all eventualities, all possibilities of outcomes with this election. And almost each and every one of them have concluded that there is a high likelihood of violence, civil unrest, and a constitutional crisis in the aftermath of this election. As this podcast has continued and and moved forward and evolved, that is one of the screeches of mine that has been the loudest. That this election is a powder keg. No matter which way you look at it, the threats of fraud coming from both Trump and Biden, he's going to try to steal the election, remember that, are attacking the legitimacy, perceived legitimacy of this election. You do not have a democracy if the population doesn't trust the outcome. And whether or not these perceptions are based in fact and reality doesn't matter. The perception is where the trust comes from, or lack thereof, both sides. Starting with Stacey Abrams, moving to Donald Trump before the election in 2016. He was, he was harping how the election was going to be stolen when he thought he was going to lose. He was preaching that the election was going to be taken away from him in 2016, attacking the integrity of the elections, the perceived integrity of the elections, the perception that we can trust our own democracy. And Joe Biden... Did the same thing earlier this year. I hope that you understand the gravity of that and what that means. This isn't just something you're going to watch on television. This is the foundation of your house being attacked with a jackhammer. You add to it covid Yikes. And we're two months away. 
One final piece of commentary here before I get off. I posted uh, something this week saying that, uh, and I firmly believe this, that if there ever was a year where you need to get up, put on your mask, and march your happy ass down to the polling place, stand in line, six feet apart from one another, and stand there as long as it takes to vote in person, COVID, coronavirus be damned, this is the year to do it. Because the more mail-in ballots go into the system, the louder the screeches of mail fraud are going to be. The louder the screeches of a stolen election. They've also pointed out that since more conservatives are going to vote in person, Most conservatives are going to vote in person, or fewer conservatives will mail in their ballots. Maybe that's the best way to put it, that on election night. As vote totals start coming in, Donald Trump's going to look like a landslide winner. But in the days and weeks that follow, as the mail-in ballots come trickling in, it's going to look like Joe Biden made a stellar comeback. How do you think that's going to feed the stolen election narrative? It doesn't matter if it's true. All that matters is the perception. And I've said this before, all that people have to do is ask themselves one simple question. Can I believe this? In this case, can I believe that the election was stolen? (laughs) The burden of proof. It doesn't take much. If you really want to believe it, you'll believe it. I beg you. If you're considering taking advantage of COVID, and using that as a reason not to go to your polling place in November, please, for the love of God, don't. Unless you are extremely high risk. Put your mask on. Take your hand sanitizer. Go stand in line and vote in person. Try to mitigate this as best you can as an individual, and that just means doing what you can do. Not scared of much. I'm more fascinated most of the time. The aftermath of this election scares me. The batshit fringe cults are primed and ready to go at each other's throats. And all we need is one quote unquote fraudulent election. Good time. Really, I thought that was going to be about 10 minutes. Hmm. I haven't been active. I've been busy. I feel like Vesuvius is about to explode. Are you excited? Are you happy? Good. Escapingthecave.com, that's the website. You can get me over Twitter at ETCPod. Don't expect much there. I'll talk about that more some other time. Also, the Facebook page, if you want. If you can find the group, you're welcome to apply and join. I will mute you if you're a doofus. That's why I have the group, because I can mute people. (laughs) Anyway, look for the Democratized Opinion episode. That's coming soon. Another episode with Brian coming up first part of next week, and then hopefully I'll get back into that propaganda series and finish it this time in good order. Thank you ever so much for clicking in. Talk to you next time. So long.